Amen. Amen. Drew out, we've got a we've got a chance to roll with things here today. And we really enjoyed talking with you about Genesis chapter six, the controversial part. And having said that, there was more in the text um, to chapter six than we went through on that other episode. So we could follow up with more of that uh, in that chapter. Also, Bradster had some ideas to talk with too. And it's not like we have to do one or the other. So we could actually mix it up. How does that sound? No, but that's, that sounds fine. Matter of fact, I was contemplating how actually, uh, um, I know Brad was talking to you about where did Jesus go for the three days before he, re- before he rose. And actually, you could connect that back to some of the things that we were talking about last show, because we do have the abode of the dead, right? We have Sheol, which that exactly what that means. So when we <laughs> look at that aspect, we, they are related in a sense, because there, there was a place called Abraham's bosom. And we do see that there were two places in the abode of the dead that where people stayed via by what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16. Oh, what a fascinating tie-in, brother. Let's, let's go down that. Let's do it. Bradster, what do you think of when Drew Out has these connections? And you've pulled out these connections, too. I'm always, I always love the chance to discuss the tie-ins. How do you, how do those things come to you when you're when you're studying? Does, does, is it an organic thing that's happening? Are you working through like a commentary that brings up those connections or something? Or how does that happen with you, brother? With me, I just see the different interpretations of these passages, which are clearly have always been there, and I just make a proper selection based on where the consistent understanding is with Scripture, because we know that God isn't teaching a million things at once, not to believe that I have it all figured out with a solid answer that defeats all others, but that's my goal, to look for the most consistent answer. And yes, it does use commentaries. Commentaries, Matthew Henry and John Gill and Adam Clark, and I benefited a lot from a lot of different folks and from learning from good brothers like Andrew. And I have another really good friend that I learned from a lot. His name's J.C. Bear. And then I have another good friend named David. I'll leave it at that for the sake of the recording. Thank you, my friend. So, Drew, out. we have this tie-in here that you're, that you're teasing us with, and I'm really intrigued. How did it come in your First of all, how did you become aware of the connection, and what is how did the link? How does the linkage start to build out? As I was watching or listening, excuse me, to the previous one that you put out, number eleven on Genesis six, towards the end when Brad brought up Peter and how Jesus went down and preached to the spirits in prison, and I know that. R.C. Sproul and some others say, oh, that's linked to the flood, and Jesus was preaching through Noah to the, what would you say, pre-Diluvian? <laughs> Is that, that the way you put it the last time? Era. And I don't see that in there because, well, first and foremost, there's, how would you put it? There's a way in, in which he's communicating that there's a correlation within the judgment but the judgment is pronounced, and it and we're looking at the judgment of the cross, but how the judgment of the cross is tied in with the flood and the saving of Noah and his family, excuse me. But at the same time, it's also talking about when he died and he was buried, and he had to, and when he ri- raised in between that period between the death and the resurrection, it says he went down down and he preached to the to the people who were formerly or the spirits who were formerly dis, disobedient. And so when we look at Abraham or Abraham or Abraham's bosom in Luke 16, Jesus gives us a picture of what's happening between the rich man and Lazarus and that there's a great gulf fixed in between and this is a literal picture and he ties in also which is very interesting the gospel in there because Abraham replies back to the rich man he, and says, even if though somebody was to rise from the dead, you would they would still not believe, speaking of the rich man's brothers who were still alive at the time. And so the gospel is tied in there, but yet there was an atonement not yet made. And so 
because the atonement was not yet made, the Old Testament saints could not enter heaven before Christ. Because, first of all, Christ had to be the first one, first man to enter heaven, leading a triumphal procession of the saints, the redeemed, who have been redeemed. Thank you for unpacking that, brother. Getting us started. Just the first thing to remind folks listening to the Boo Crew, we're not a synod. We're not a council. We're three mud pies talking and having a good time. So we, this is a really interesting and intense controversial idea. And the first thing I want to note, thank you, Drew Out, for talking about this, is that we are, the first thing we can say immediately is that science, as commonly understood, has nothing to say to us. So there's a big fascination today in the world with scientific proof and demonstration and showing your work and justified true belief and having a warrant to believe this. When we are talking about what happens after we die, in this Christian doctrine sense, we are stepping across a chasm that we cannot materially or physically do in this lifetime. And so we are reading the scriptures with this lens, uh, and we are the only reason we can even stand out and have any knowledge about what's coming, what this state is going to be like, is because of the scriptures. And there's two main issues to think about here that, that I love how you were, you've already started down. So John Calvin said, paraphrased, of course, there are two errors in theology. The first one is not going where the scriptures explicitly go, and the second one is going past where the scriptures explicitly go and into places where it doesn't go, but thinking that it does. So what a, what a topic. And so I was just taking a look here at Burkhoff, and Burkhoff has really got an interesting historical way of thinking about this. So believe it or not, there was no unanimity among the early church fathers, but when we have people thinking about this, there's this idea of a quote-unquote intermediate state between death and resurrection. And so Burkhoff cites early church fathers, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Novatian, Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, Ambrose, Augustine. And so eventually, of course, this is going to, this is going to develop into states further down the road. So past Augustine, there are going to be thinkers who develop some of these ideas into things like, for example, the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. But on the other side of the early church father's fence, you have this idea from folks like Gregory of Nazianza, Eusebius, Gregory the Great. You have this idea that at death, the souls of the righteous just immediately enter into heaven. And so you have this tension here, and you have this, you have this conflict in the readings there. And so when you are starting out here, I think you're, you're, you've got this, these connections that you're seeking to make with the Scriptures. And I think that leads us to ask, where's the comfort here in this doctrine? In other words, God could tell us all of the great details about what's coming. And he could say, okay, here, after you die, you're going to go to a pizza place, you're going to have the best pizza— you've ever eaten, and then I'm going to take you down to the clinic, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to measure this. And I'm not saying that this is what the Scriptures say. What I'm trying to say is the idea that God is going to do a lot of things with the believer after death should be an open book in our thinking, even if ahead of time he doesn't give us a full description of that. And so that that was just my one lead, and I wanted to tie in here as we go down this. So I'm not sure if I directly answered you there, brother. And if not, I apologize. Do you just want to respond on that? Sure. Yeah. What encouragement do we get? What encouragement do we get? God keeps his promises. And even when we see vaguely one aspect of like when we're dealing with the abode of the dead, we're seeing that God was faithful to keep his his elect, those whom he called, those he, he said he was going to redeem. And we see that God fulfills his promise in the redemption through his son. And so we should be looking forward to the promises of God as this is encouragement. And at the same time, we can look that God didn't do everything at once. He just didn't go day one, boom, here's all the redeemed and here's all those who are not redeemed and we're all done. No, 
there there is something specifically communicated in what God does and the one that's the wonderful thing is God is communicating to us as finite creatures what he is doing uh, what he is doing and what he has done, not only in that aspect, but by virtue of what he is doing and what he has done and what he has put down for us to read, he is revealing his nature, his character, who he is and who we are by virtue of what he is doing. And I think that's wonderful because it, it's the encouragement of seeing as we grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, first and foremost, that as we are progressively sanctified, we see these truths coming about. And then when we think about the atonement, yeah, God had to atone. God is holy. God had to do this, do this act to fulfill his holiness in commitment of love to his elect, which is a beautiful thing. And as we see this aspect of what is happening, as vague as it may be, it's there. You see it. You can't deny it. That's why there was debates over it in the past, and there still are today. We see this picture, but we see a picture of what God is doing and how God, once again, like in the last episode that I said, had made the comment, God is a God of order, and and he's the God of knowledge, God of logic, God of love, God of holiness, but these are all simultaneously at once who God is. And when we see it revealed in the scripture and we see different aspects of it, just like, once again, I've used the analogy before, it's like a diamond. We see different facets, but it's all one diamond and it's beautiful. That is an incredible question that must be answered. And we know there's three different schools of thought ultimately. We could say there's many more that branch out from the from these three schools of thought, but nevertheless, there's three different schools of thought. There is the the view that Jesus simply just died, and and that involves a lot of soul sleep and things like that. Then there is the view, and that would yeah, there's some problems with that. But then there is the two major views here, and I will touch on this because it hasn't really been brought up yet. Many people think Hades, and they think hell, and they think Jesus went into hell when he went down into the depths, and that is a pretty dominant view all throughout church history, and it blossoms into all these things like purgatory, even into the universalism type of thinking, even. Not that it's necessitated by these, but it starts by this first thought of Hades, Okay, and then we have what Brother Drew out and me are alluding to here, where truly today you will be with me in paradise, and we're taking the Luke 16, verse 19 through 31 scriptures very literally about Lazarus and the rich man, believing that they are a foretold future, at least once a man's or a woman's is dead, and believing that it is a status, not just an argument or a point, as the annihilist or soul sleeper would affirm. And so most most people in the history of the church would affirm this too in regards to Jesus going into actual Hades slash hell as well. And from here, I'll let you guys have at it again. You got anything to add to that, Mr. Drew out? Yeah, Bradster. If you guys don't mind, there's an article that on Desiring God written by Joe Rigney, and he covers an important aspect of this particular part, topic. And I'd like to read a little bit from him, if you guys don't mind. And he asks the question, what is death? First of all, what exactly is death? Death is separation, a dividing of things that ought to be united. Fundamentally, it is separation from God, Paul suggests, as Much in Ephesians 2, 1 through 2, you were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked. To walk in sin is to be dead, to be enslaved to dark powers, to be separated from God, to be children of his wrath. This This type of separation is an estrangement, a hostility, an alienation from the life of God and the hope of the living God. In this sense, all of us by nature are born dead, and in its and. It is death that Jesus endured in his suffering on the cross. 
but of course, death is more than just separation from God. Death also marks separation of the soul from the body. God made human beings to be embodied souls. And in soul bodies, and death rips us from this union, or excuse me, and death rips this union asunder. But what happens to these two parts after they are separated? Psalm 16.10 gives us a window into the biblical teaching. As David writes, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. Now, just notice from that part, I won't read the whole thing, but just notice that one part. David talks about himself. You will not abandon my soul in the abode of the dead, Abraham's bosom. But he also refers to Jesus Christ. You will not let his body see decay. David's body did see decay. David and the Old Testament saints and those who were not elect, were their life or their souls were separated from their bodies. And they were put in a place, whether waiting for the final judgment into everlasting contempt or the final judgment into everlasting life. So I think that's an important distinction to make. And also, at the end, you will not let your Holy One see corruption, that Jesus, this is a, alludes to the resurrection and where Jesus rips off the gates of the abode of the dead, or hell, comes in and grabs captivity captive. And at the end, he's going to give gifts to men. His church, the new covenant, is uh, by therefore installed and is the permanent fixture in which God makes or God's redemptive act is completed and in which is basically completed. And we see that God gets all the glory in redemption. And this redemptive in, in the redemptive story, it has a beginning and it goes through time. My friend, I love that article that you read. Thank you for that. And I love unpacking in the psalm there. If it's okay, maybe I'll just read a little bit more fully that story from Luke 16, because when I find I'm talking with people about what happens to people after death and this idea of an intermediate state, I feel like my flank is in the air. In other words, people seem to have less goodwill in being willing to listen to me talk about this than most topics. And that makes me a little bit insecure because I'm, of course, used to talking with people as a journey, this good faith. We're walking down this path together and thinking about things, and people are often reluctant to do. And this story in the scriptures, I think, gives us warrant to go down that path somewhat in the manner that you've indicated, uh, Drew, out. So let me just read from Luke chapter 16, this story about the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. But instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment, in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things, just as Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here while you are in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot, neither can those from there cross over to us. Father, Lazarus said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house, because I have five brothers, to warn them so that they won't also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, the rich man said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Abraham replied, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, 
even if someone rises from the dead. Now, that story there is compelling, and it's gripping. And, and Drew Out, you've talked about the reasons why it's compelling. It has this pull on you. There's the rich man on one side. He's in torment. He's in flame. And then there's also the joyful believers who are received by God into a state of paradise. And there's a chasm that cannot be crossed between the two of them. And that is just something really terrible to consider in its implications for us in this life. And so I love the tie-in. When you first mentioned that uh, that Luke 16 reference, I was like, I was thinking to myself, oh, I got to read that story, because it is one of my favorite passages in the whole Gospel of Luke, because of this compelling nature. So I think we're seeing now that this passage, along with Psalm 16 that you cited, is really starting to give us a picture. We're standing out over the edge of what, where we could ever possibly hope to go scientifically, but yet we're receiving knowledge from God directly about what this is and what we're facing. And so how would you build on that, thinking about this and the connection that we were talking about earlier? Wow, that's, that's a good question. It is great. I would just build on it from the way Scripture represents it. God, first and foremost, is a holy God, we're seeing. But at the same time, He's a, he's a loving and gracious God. And we see that the rich man, he had all his good things in life. It wasn't that God didn't give him good things as before he passed, but you think about what did he do with those good things and what spirit was he of? We know that, as Paul states, a Jew is not one who is one inwardly, but he, I mean outwardly, but he is one who is one inwardly. And that talks about the immaterial or the spiritual act or state, excuse me, not act, that one is in. And in our own selves, we have that witness. We have the Spirit who testifies within us. We knew that at the day we were saved, all of a sudden we were illuminated. Our minds, we could see. We, our hearts were changed. We turned from darkness to light. And it, we see in that aspect that there was a difference. The poor man, even though he did not have things when he was alive. He had Christ. He had the truly good thing. And he had the precious promises of God. And he would find rest in the future after he had passed that comfort. And that's the comfort we sh should all look forward or look forward to, excuse me. Now, also, we see in the text that it has to be something that God does. Because you notice when Abraham says, hey, he has Moses and the prophets. Let him hear them. They were his brothers. Let them hear them. And he says, oh, no, they need definitive proof. They need to see Lazarus in person. Send him. And they, he, you notice he's still treating Lazarus like a dog in that because he's treating him like he's some type of servant or his servant. But again, he says, and let Lazarus goes back from the dead, he will definitely turn their hearts. But we know this is not true because we know, as previously read from the articles of the spiritual death and in Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, we see that spiritual death, that separation, that, that those who are under that are under the wrath of God. They are currently under that wrath. And unless God intervenes, there is no hope apart from that. And so they would not hear the scriptures, and they would not believe, even though somebody rises from the dead. When you think about after Jesus rose, how many people would believe? Paul the Apostle staunchly fought against the brothers and sisters of the faith, put it in, had papers to put them in, pri in prison and kill them. And he had to literally be stopped by Christ on the road. And Yes, God changed his heart, and God displayed himself in such a way and turned his heart so on fire for him that we have what we have today in the scriptures because of that, because of what God did. And it's a wonderful thing that we are able to go directly to the scriptures and evaluate what God has revealed to us and also in what pertains to the subject 
before Christ rose and led the captivities captive and gave gifts to his bride. And that's, it's so beautiful in what God does. And it's, at the same time, it's holy, it's pure, it's chaste, merciful, loving, everything at once. And those are the things I love to bring out because we can have the full assurance of faith knowing what God has done in us, not only that, but currently, but in the past, we can see a history of God's faithfulness. Oh, brother. Wow. That is so beautiful. One of the things that most important to remember when considering these awful, terrible events of what's coming is to remember that God is giving us knowledge of these things for two reasons. Number one, to warn the unrepentant. This is what's coming to you. And then number two, to comfort the believer. I have joy planned for you, which is what we remember from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good, to prosper you, bring you to an expected end. And then drew out in that psalm that you mentioned, it says, Lord, you are my portion and the cup of my blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. And so I loved that reference there. Bradster, I feel like we should take off our shoes for we are standing on holy ground here, Bradster, thinking about these things. How does that strike you, this idea that there's this intensity about this that makes ignoring it such a dangerous thing. What did, That's what the rich guy did, right? He had the scriptures, he had Moses and the prophets, presumably, and he ignored them. And now look at this terrible end. Amen to that, my brother. And I love the way Drew Out communicated this. The main point of this is it's not worth ganging the whole world and losing yourself. That's the main point of everything that was just spoken. But The backdrop is built on the foundation of truth that leads to the second death, which is the lake of fire. And to deny that is, in my mind, spiritually dangerous. Right here, we had three schools of thought, as I was referring to earlier. You have the people that would say Jesus would go to Hades in regards to the place that's hot, if you know what I'm saying. And then there's the people that say, like what me and Drew out and Brother J.C. Bear here are pointing out is Abraham's bosom is where Jesus went. And then you have people, ironically, that'll deny this entire portion as trustworthy information that should be used. Not Maybe that, that was not the best way to say it, but what they're doing is they compare this sort of writing to writings outside the Bible around the time era in which this came out. And they will say, he was just using this to bring board a point, and this is how you get soul sleep. So what they're essentially would be saying is not a good thing in my estimation, but the same way they would get today, comma, you will be with me in paradise by one manuscript variant. That's not exactly what we have going on here. We have today, you will be with me in paradise in every manuscript other than that one that could possibly just have a mark on it by a scribe's pen. And it's not even confirmed or denied if that is in fact truly a comma in that particular scripture that had to do with the thief on the cross. How is this relevant? In every way. We went from three views, really, to to two brother views, which is Jesus went to Hades either way, whether it was whether it was Abraham's bosom or whether it was the hot part over here, if you know what I'm saying, where the chasm set. Now, and then that's one view I would titleize that. And then the second option would obviously be this soul sleep. Martin Luther took the second option. A lot of people that teach annihilationism take this second option like I used to as a teacher. But when you see that God is not just springboarding a point, but he is conveying a truth that really should not be denied, especially when you go to Romans 5 and read from 12 to 21, and you cannot justify 
physical death alone in light of spiritual life. This is qualified by eternal that's mentioned in 2021. So we see that hell is a real place. It is extremely hot. And we even have qualifiers here that help us see the way there, so to speak. Bradster, that was so timely. We have, there, there really is reason for fear here. And for perhaps more people than we're maybe initially thinking about. And where am I going with this? There's two thoughts that come to me when I'm thinking about this passage in Luke chapter 16. So the first one is, if I can express it gently, I am mad as heck, mad as Hades. <laughs> I am mad as Sheol <laughs> at my at my non-Calvinist brothers for making a big fuss in Romans 9 about individual versus corporate and other aspects of the not of the typical non-Calvinist interpretation of Romans chapter 9. Luke 16 confirms what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 9. So remember, the big question for Romans chapter 9 is, okay, God is, has instituted this new thing, this quote-unquote new covenant, and Christ has been given. He has paid the sin debt. It's happened. He's resurrected and ascended. The Holy Spirit has been given. And now, in light of this, in Romans chapter 9, Paul is answering the question, what about the previous gig? What about the previous situation? What about the Jews who, while they're faithful to their Judaism and their traditions of the fathers and what they had received from God in the Old Testament, what about them? And Paul makes the statement in Romans chapter 9 that they do not have a portion in the future with God apart from Christ, and they never did. And that sounds harsh to people, except that's what we have here in Luke chapter 16. This rich man, he's calling out for Father Abraham. He's absolutely someone who thinks, I've got descent from Abraham. I'm part of the lineage. I'm part of the chosen people. I'm in. And yet there he is in eternal torment, never to leave it. And so the first thing I just want to say about this passage is that Romans chapter 9, as Calvinistically understood, is vindicated by this. And then the second thing I want to point out is what really irks me about many quote-unquote Christians, and I'm not here to wag the bony finger of, I think I'm better than you. I'm trying to point out a really big danger. Hades, Sheol, hell, a nasty place, H-E double toothpicks, to use a technical term here, (laughs) is going to be filled with people who profess faith in a worldly sense, what, what I mean is they said pe- during their lifetime, they said and thought they were in the club. But when it came to the means of knowledge, they utterly neglected them. And I'm thinking here of in, in this rich man, we see somebody from this Jewish rabbinic tradition. Where did all of his wise study get him? First of all, he didn't have very much of it because he thought he was in just being a good Jew. But on top of that, he had a lifetime of exposure to Moses and the prophets, and it didn't help him one bit, not to the Scripture's fault, of course, but to his own. And this makes me want to scream at my liberal brothers and sisters in the Christian faith who have what we Calvinists call a low view of Scripture. So this rich man, by the way, Abraham is named, Lazarus is named. The rich man is not named. Why? Because it is shameful to name him. He has done so poorly. He had Moses and the prophets, and he kicked it to the curb. He couldn't have cared less. And so I say liberal Christianity. Other words could be a secular form of Christianity, a modern Christianity, an enlightenment-based Christianity. We can talk about language here, but let me share with you the listeners, I'm reading through a systematic theology text written by people who profess to be Christians, who I suspect are perhaps the intellectual heirs of this rich man. It's a systematic theology where they talk about, oh, what did Karl Barth say? What did, what's his name say? What did Pannenberg say? What did Troelch say and Ritchell say? And didn't so have some insights? And what about Hierwas? And all of this, that, and the other thing. And 
there's never any scripture in this systematic theology. And it scares me because where might a scriptureless theology go? And I think this gentleman in Luke chapter 16 has shown us just where it's pointed. And that terrifies me for my liberal Christian friends. Drew out, you've, you, you're the one who pointed us here. Where would you go? Where would you go from at this point thinking about some of those things? Yeah, hey, you're right on point. It, you got me thinking, the scripture hit my mind of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul talks about the Jews who make their boast in the law. There's a veil that hangs over their face, and their minds were hardened. And they, to the, and at this point, Paul is, says, even to this day, a veil remains over them. Let's see, I'm trying to find it right here. Yeah, the same veil remains. Okay, so when we're looking back, that when Paul says not all Israel is Israel, and they're looking to the law for a salvific happening. If I can keep this, I can keep that, or I can do this, I can do that, I will be righteous. And we know that Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so they were looking in the wrong place in the scriptures. And of course, their minds were hardened. They were veiled. And then Paul goes on and he says in verse 16, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. And oh, he just puts that so beautifully. And the monergist, monergistic aspect where he is giving glory to the Lord for the salva salvation that he provides. Everyone else outside of that, like liberal Christians, I don't, I hate using the term liberal Christians because I don't think there is <laughs> such a thing, uh, first <laughs> and foremost. Because when Jesus said to those who came to him, Lord, we did this in your name, we did that in your name. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. I, I, I never knew you. I never had an intimate knowledge of you. I never knew you before the foundation of the world. I never knew you. It's a terrifying, it's a terrifying thing to look at. And does that mean we we don't desire anybody that who is outside right now not to be saved? No. Just as Paul began out in Romans 9, he says, My heart's desire is for my brethren. I would give my own self to be anathema, accursed for eternity, put into the lake of fire for my own brethren's sake. Now, would the God... Would all Christians have this same desire? And I, I believe it, it does come in spurts as we are progressively being transformed into the same image of Christ. Would to God we all be the Apostle Paul and have that same zeal and same desire? And that would be lovely. But uh, we do know that God has a plan, a purpose. And yes, we do have a, a command to go out and preach the gospel. And it does go out from us. Does it go out from us every single day to every single person? No, it doesn't. And the Lord works in and through with what he has provided. And yes, there is an accountability factor. We should preach Christ and him crucified to everyone so that we will not have any blood on our hands. But at the same time, we see how God works in his own economy, saving people. He will never lose one. He will. He is faithful and he is the one who draws his sheep, and he will raise them up at the last day because they are his sheep. It's I'm getting lost within my thoughts right here because I'm thinking about the faithfulness of God and the beauty of it. But yeah, when we look at those who are outside and they're in these liberal camps and they're saying, Rabbi so-and-so, Rabbi, Rabbi Hillel said this, but ra the other rabbi but, uh, said this, that was not the point. That's not the, the point is what does the word of God say? What does God say to us? And I think that was beautifully put by you is, yeah, it is a scary thing. And at the same time, it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing we see. It's evil per personified because we're looking at the lies of Satan when it diverts from the scripture. And we know that he's a murderer from the beginning. 
and he destroys. He still kills and destroys. That's what he does. And yes, there is a purpose to it. Uh, there is a judgment factor that is going on. But at the same time, we are to be transformed, reaching out to everyone, preaching the gospel, because there is a purpose for the gospel for everyone to hear. And whether that purpose is to compound judgment upon judgment or life from the dead, that is for God to decide. He gives the increase, and we should stand in what God has ordained from before the foundation of the world. Amen. Bradster, these discussions are taking us all through the scriptures, revealing all sorts of fault lines, as Brother Drew Out is talking about here too, the awesomeness of God. Not in the colloquial sense, oh, I hit two home runs today when I played baseball. That was awesome. Not aw- God is not awesome when we speak of him as being awesome. He's not just awesome in that sense, but he's awesome in that in that while we humans, we sinners, were playing patty cake with him, with our false religion, he is never deceived, and the books will be balanced at the end of time. And what do you do when you're talking with someone who's, who's maybe struggling with that idea of false religion or false ideas about religion? This is tied in to a can of worms that I opened up, so we need to look to the scriptures really quick before I have any word to add to this regarding the worm that never dies could would you pull up J.C. bear mark nine it's around 40-ish it's where he talks about the worm that never dies i i need to bring this passage up for a very important reason because it's tied in with what the intermediate state is like and what the lake of fire is like and how they tie together and who is the one saying it and who has the final authority in all things? Mark chapter 9, Jesus says, If your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Brother, that got deep and intense really quickly. (laughs) How would you build on that further? Right off, notice that he says it's better. It's better. He's not saying that it's more ideal to be in heaven than it is to simply just be in the state. He is saying that you are going to be tortured because he's comparing a form of current torture as better than what you would encounter if you was to go to this place. So this is a warning. This isn't just a subject to bring up, it is better to go to Starbucks than it is to have a Folgers cup of coffee. No, that's not what he's doing right here. And he does it in three different forms of torture. Look at these forms of torture. Your foot off. Could you imagine that? That's some Saul movie stuff right there, huh? Could you imagine getting your hand cut off? Mm, There it is again. Could you imagine your eye gouged out? I had both of mine gouged out, so I'll tell you From personal experience, it is long and torturous and extremely painful for this idea to actually be thought of with any sort of honesty, intellectual, intellectually speaking, that is. And when you consider these things, it's tied to an immediate follow-up. It's not tied to, and after the resurrection, no, it's an immediate follow-up here. He talks about the worm never dying. Nothing's going to stop his judgment, just like the annihilationists teach. That's true. And the fire never being quenched. Nothing's going to stop his fire. That's very true. And it is very torturous in description when you take this at its literal conclusion that Christ has given us. Matthew 25, he says, The wicked go to everlasting punishment, but the righteous to everlasting life. This is a horrible place to go. Drew out. I think that I think that we have found that these connections are so substantial that 
one has to fear to ignore them. And you've talked about whether or not there is a such thing as a liberal Christianity. And I'm with you. Not in the sense that you and I are sitting back in our nice high chair, our nice plush leather high chair, smoking cigars, looking down on the people shining our shoes and thinking, oh, I wonder if that person is in the club. Of course, he's not in the club. We're not doing that. What we're doing is we're scared. Reading these texts, and if it's one thing to be explicitly against Jesus, it's no better to think you're being for Jesus, but to have an unacceptable offering like Cain. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there. Guys, forgive me. We, the big movement of our lifetimes in the United States, as well as the West in general, has been the fall of Christianity into this socialist liberation theology, into this Christian Marxism, into this wokeism. And maybe there's a better label. But I think, let me just share what I hear from these folks who I'm concerned are espousing the kind of situation that's present in these chapters that we're reading from. So take, for example, Luke 16. I'll have woke liberal friends who'll read that passage and say to, say to me, ha ha, look at you, conservative Calvinist. Do you see what the scripture is teaching right there? Look at you, you're rich, you're in America, you're in the top 10% of all people in the world in terms of wealth, and yet the other 90% of the world is not wealthy. And look at you, conservative Calvinist, you're like this rich man. And first of all, I'm not ignoring the moral force of that argument. We Calvinists, if we have no regard for the poor, are clearly in the danger that this text talks about. But I think they've missed something. And that is, was it really a lack of regard for the poor that threw that rich man in there? In some sense, sure. That's what the text talks about. He had no regard for Lazarus. And even drew out, you brought it perfectly, said that even in this state of torment, the rich man doesn't see Lazarus as anything other than a dog, as a servant. Go, hey, Abraham, go send Bark here to go do some errands for me. Listen, hear that condescension. But it says this, it says that he neglected the scriptures. Abraham and the prophets, or I'm sorry, Moses and the prophets he had. And the rich man's, the root cause of the rich man's fault was not his lack of care for the poor. That was the fruit of the real problem, which was complete an utter disregard, a low view of the scriptures. And so I see, if I can say this without being overly inflammatory, I see all of my Christian Marxist brothers, and I say brothers in the loose generic sense, look, look, I've had liberals treat me with respect and dignity and care. I've had liberals be good to me in my life. I've had lots of liberals do lots of nice things for me, but nice isn't enough. And I'm really concerned about that. And Drew Out, you've said something similar. How would you build on that, thinking about this idea, this tension that we're facing in the world today? That's a good question. First and foremost, we have to go back to what is the truth? And I think that's what we're, we're all aiming at, is what is the truth of the matter? And clearly in Luke 16, that's what Abraham is pointing out. He says, what is the truth of the matter? It's God in the scriptures. It's God in the scriptures. I had to rephrase that. <laughs> it's God in the scriptures. They weren't looking for they weren't looking for God in the scriptures. They weren't looking for the God of the scriptures. And so when that happens, they by nature are already showing that they are children of wrath. And what follows from that is that deception that comes that's not only deceiving themselves, but it comes out of them. As Jesus said, from the heart the mouth speaks, and it shows who they are in that aspect. Now, again, at one time, we, are, we were all that way before God got a hold of us and changed us. So in the aspect of grace, we should be seeking, once again, to be people of grace. Yes, we should feed the poor. Yes, we should regard our brother. But there, there also has to be discernment in it as well. I mean, my, myself personally— I see homeless people every time I'm at work because I certain deliveries, I have to go in back of stores and stuff like that, and I see the homeless. And my heart cries for them, and I want to help them. And sometimes there's limits within my job where I'm on a time schedule. I 
can't stop, do this or that or the other. And sometimes I'm there and I give them money and I hope they're going to use it for what they should use it for. But most of the times that would not be the case. I would rather just give them some of my food out of my vehicle. So yes, there's, there's an aspect of, yes, we should feed the poor. But most importantly, as Jesus said, we should not labor for the, for the food of the earth. I'm going to put it in my own words, but that food that, he, that goes for eternal life. And so when we're out there, we should be giving out the bread from heaven, the bread which God gives. And God, once again, God determines who eats and who doesn't. And by, by that very nature, by which is instilled in the person, determines whether they eat or not. God gives the increase. And I think first and foremost, that's of what is of utmost importance. And also, I'd like to point out another thing is when we regard the poor, who do we regard first as the poor? We regard first and foremost the poor in the church and then those who are outside. So the church does take care of its own. As you read in the scripture, there's guidelines for widows and who are really widows. Because for the most part, even Christians, we, they have the essence of sin dwelling within them. And Paul, Paul makes it a point within the passage uh, when he's teaching about <clears throat> widows and who are truly widows. I think if I'm rem- remembering it correctly, he said, do not accept a widow within the fol- fold, excuse me, unless they are 60 year, years or older. He's lying out these, making, laying out these parameters because of the evilness within our own hearts, men and women alike. Um, and also if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. So who are really the poor? So the poor are the ones who cannot help themselves. And we have to have discernment. And it starts first and foremost in the church and then to those who are outside. And to those who are outside, we should be giving the gospel along with food. First and foremost, prayer. Coming to God, the prayers of a righteous man avail with much. It's very important to have the right attitude towards your work and to actually consider yourself a worker for the kingdom. The Great Commission teaches this to all of us who are Christians, because all authority is given to Jesus Christ, not some, and then later he's going to get more. He always is under, he, he is always with all authority. So the reason I bring this up, what heart do we come with? A giving heart. And we come with discernment too, but We have to look at the scriptures where it says the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but for us who are being saved, it's the power of God. How do we read this? How do we understand this? Oh, God gave you life for what? Do you read it like this? The cross is foolishness for those morons that aren't like me. The one being saved, I hear this a lot from a lot of Calvinists. I hear this a lot from a lot of people that They claim to know God, but if you say you know him and you don't love your brother, then you're a liar and the truth's not in you. And I always get brokenhearted more by people that'll gather up, talk about theology, and not talk about helping other people, not talk about let's let's pray, let's get together, let's make a difference. Because God gave us the heart to do it. God has to put it on your heart. It's all about God, all God, sovereign God. Very true. But he doesn't not put it on anyone's heart that are, that's in Christ. Nobody that is in Christ has the mission to make it about themselves. Oh, I'm saved. I'm good. Ha, idiots. You're not. And that's the attitude that we get online when we go to social media. That's the attitude. Oh, I'm going to work on a good joke to, to bash these people that don't agree with me, jot for tittle over here. I'm going to do everything in my power to show everybody the truth by showing that I'm a complete jerk. It's not it, friends. It is not. We can all believe whatever we want to believe, but if Christ is in us and he's the hope of glory, then we are going to reign with him right now. We're not going to wait for a thousand years. We're going to reign with him right now, or we don't know him. How can you say God who showed you mercy, but you don't show your brothers and sisters mercy? You don't show the world mercy. You don't demonstrate, you don't act out what God has acted in. How can you ever say that he has acted anything inside of you? I don't care what's wrong in your life. I have fake eyes. I have hearing aid in one ear, a cochlear ear implant in the other, and I can see the good in that. Why can't you? Before you get online and type up some big, ha ha, gotcha, I'm the Mr. Calvinist guy that's so good, so great, so much better than you. Then think about what I just said, and I hope that hits home. 
and God bless you. And I'll throw it over to Drew out to uh, elaborate some thoughts on that. What can you add to that? That was that was well stated. I don't think I would want to add anything to that. Yeah, if I was to add anything to it, I would just be aware that we all go through stages. And that's why they have the meme Calvinist cage stage meme up there. And it's funny because it's true because when people first get into Reformed theology, it's boom. They're like, no. And then next thing you know, they're fighting it or they're fighting it at first. And then they're just like, they give in to the truth. And then uh, and then next thing you know, they're telling everybody and saying, you got to believe this. You got to believe this. Yet there are stages to it. So I would want to be careful in one, one aspect of putting him into a place where they're just stuck in the aha. Yeah, they will. They will for a time be in, in that circumstances circumstance unless they are not, as Brother Bradster has indicated, that if they're still in that stage, Number one, they could be just in a stage of immaturity and they're still on milk. They're not growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not remembering the grace of God as rightly. Because if we're remembering the grace of God, we're remembering also the judgment of God, which should be horrifying to anyone. And I think we need to take things in a perspective that things that God works through time, number one. Okay, and in that time, I've seen in my own life <laughs> a long time of coming to the place where I am at now, theologically or sanctification wise, we could say, in where we have a state of mind that produces a fruit which God has desired to put in us. Yes, we do have to, at one time, and in Jesus' prayer in John 17, he says, I pray that you make them one as we are one, Father. Can we overemphasize certain aspects of what God does over other things? Yes, absolutely. Those, and those are time periods. Yes, we should be saying it's God's glory. It's God's glory. But at the, other, at the same time, looking at God's grace, God's love, God's holiness, God's justice, we, ha we have to take every single thing that God is and look at it for what it is and look at ourselves as slaves of righteousness and what that entails. So, yeah, they, there, I believe there is a what we call a growing stage when a person first gets saved and they're a little baby and they're just telling everybody how great Jesus is. But they don't have a, a good foundation of what the Bible teaches. And that only comes with time, with teaching, sitting under those guys. God has appointed over the church as his gifts to the church, and also just being in and checking to see whether the things that they're being taught are true. Um, and it's a sanctification is a progressive progress. And that, I think that's mostly what I would just wanted to pour out there because we all have started at one point with Christ. And the more we walk with Christ, the more he reveals. Just like at the, in the, on the road to Emmaus, when he's walking with the disciples, and they're down and out, and they're like thinking, oh, man, I, I had my hopes up. I was sure this was the Messiah. And they had the wrong view. They had the wrong view of who Jesus is. They didn't have a complete view. They had a partial view. And when Jesus, when Jesus said, oh, yeah, basically, I'm paraphrasing. And then he taught from them from the scriptures and in the scriptures, in the volume of the book, as it says in Hebrews, it is written of him. And he opened their eyes of what all about himself in the scriptures. And all. And if you are of Christ, then everything Christ is, you will be. And every aspect of the light of Christ shall eventually shine forth from you. But it takes time. It takes time. And yes, there are going to be those who are going to be stuck. They're going to be stuck in different places and their motives will not be right. But nevertheless, as Paul says, Christ is preached and it's by his spirit things come about. I, be, I guess that's about as much as I can say. And I want to thank you for that statement of interest in Christian maturity. When I first had the pleasure of seeing some of your posts on social media, the first thing I did was just enjoy what you had to say. I read it and I said, wow, this is really mature. This is good stuff. But I think there was another aspect that I saw that impressed me. 
And that was a generosity and a courteousness in responding to people who were trolling you. And I don't mean that I don't mean that you were pretending that they weren't trolling you. And I don't mean that they were necessarily trolling you in the sense that they got up in the morning and said, <laughs> had a yawn and said, boy, I can't wait till I get to troll somebody later today. But it was what had happened was the scriptures speak about being sharper than a two-edged sword. And so when we talk about the good things of God to people, the clean, the holy, the honorable things of God, we're actually fighting a spiritual sword fight. And without knowing it, our post just existing cuts. God uses that. And the truths, the scriptures say that his word does not go out from him and return without first accomplishing the purpose for which he sent it. And so when we post on social media about God's word, we are an echo. We are a reflection. We are a living testimony and witness to the truth of that, and it cuts. And so the first thing I wanted to do was thank you, brother, for that, because being aware that one could be in a potentially in the cage stage is one of the first steps to not being in that. And then secondly, the scriptures call us to be conciliatory toward the lost. I'm like everybody else. I've had religious discussions where people were just jerks back to me, and I've wanted to call down thunder on them, thunder and lightning. I've gone to the prayer closet and said, Lord, would now be a good time for some lightning? And of course, the answer is no. <laughs> One of the things that's, that we're called to is we're called to a conciliatory ministry. And that means talking with people who have little to no regard for what we say, but talking to them anyway. Now, does this mean, of course, infinite being an open to infinite amounts of, bu- of abuse from somebody who just wants to be abusive in expressing their personality? No. The scriptures nowhere proclaim that God is served when Christian doormats are walked all over. But that grace does mark, and graciousness does mark. So I wanted to just say thank you for that, Drew Out. I know, as someone who's also posted on social media, I know the kind of invective and sharp, intense things that happen when you interact with people in that fashion. And I just wanted to affirm that because I thought that was so that was so wholesome. So Bradster, we've had a great discussion time here. And it, is it okay maybe to just ask you to give us a final thought or two and then maybe close with a word of prayer? Yeah, we get Jesus Christ going down to the depths. We get him saving the Old Testament saints in his progressive timeline as it was ordained from the foundation of the world, as Brother Drew out beautifully, eloquently put. And we get the intermediate state hit on some heretical teachings overcome with some beautiful thoughts from our Lord Jesus, who doesn't just think, he declares all truth. And then we even get into Christian living. We get into the practice of being a good shepherd, being a good steward, being a good follower. And we know that Christian doesn't mean just believe. The thief on the cross, he just believed. That's what they'll tell us. But we know that he was also regenerated prior to his belief where he was he went from cussing God, glorifying God, all while having nails in his hands and feet right beside our risen Savior who said, today you'll be with me. You'll be with me. And with that being stated, I'll close with a prayer. And what a beautiful time I've had talking to my best two buddies. And uh, here we are. Actually, I'll ask Drew out if he would say this prayer. I'd be honored. Father, we just come before you. And we thank you for the grace that you have given us. And Father, as we've, J.C. Bear has so graciously put this together to put out And for people to see, and we pray, Lord, that your word goes out once again. And we know that it won't return void, Lord, but that you prime hearts, Lord God, and bring more attention, Lord, not to the podcast, but to you, Lord, because there there is no glory except for you, O Lord. Father, we pray that constantly 
once again, that to be on our minds and hearts, to glorify you, to honor you in every single way, form, fashion, <clears throat> no matter what we do in word or deed, Lord, just to glorify you, Lord. We do pray for loved ones that don't know you. We do ask for your grace on them, Lord, and those who are sick and weak within the church, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you uplift them, Father, whether you heal them or not, Lord, in this life. We know that there is a healing in the next, Lord, because we have those promises by the word made more sure. And it's by your word, Lord, that we see your love, your grace, your mercy toward us, Lord. And we just lift up these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.